appreciate the invitation. I don't know exactly uh, what to say. As you notice, I don't have any prepared notes, and you can praise the Lord for that. Uh, huh? Yeah. No, I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, I don't know exactly what you'd like to know. Um, I, I see that we have... Uh, I assume you're from out of town. Is that right? Since it's, Yeah, okay. That's out of town. And <laughs> last time I looked. Um, uh, is, is everybody here essentially a fundamentalist or, no, you know? These, these people gathered <coughs> here are all members of the church per se. Mm -hmm. These people that are gathered here have studied quite extensively and the doctors, so there's nothing that's going to fall on virgin ears. Okay. Whatever you get into, the uh, ramifications of the first visions or any aspect of Joseph Smith's life, whether you feel he's a liar or a fraud or whatever you feel he is, and the reasons for that. And we'd like for, for a chance, if you go into some of the aspects of Adam and God, at least as far as you've uh, come to understand those doctrines, and any aspect that was taught by the early prophets, and which now the modern day apologists seem to have a pretty good idea that it wasn't taught, and they give all the reasons for that. So, I, I wish you'd just feel comfortable. And, 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 and well, I just, I just really didn't know what, which way to go. When you so, first were introduced to the church, you... Uh, <coughs> well, why don't I just go with a little historical sketch and then perhaps uh, go into some of the reasons why uh, there's no way that I would consider uh, Mormonism as being from God in, in any of its forms, okay? Um, that's obviously my position. I don't, I don't think I'm shocking anybody by saying that. I think everybody knows at least what I am. I am an ex-Mormon. I joined the church uh, on my 21st birthday in Florida after uh, meeting some of the missionaries. One was from Utah and the other one was from California. And um, uh, I was your ideal contact. I was no hassle, no argument. Uh, I just went right on down the line, uh, uh, took it hook, line, and sinker. I really, really, really believed it was true and that Joseph Smith was a prophet and the whole business and uh, I was in the church for a total of ten years, jumping to the end of the story. I left three and a half years ago in July of 1975. Uh, I was not excommunicated from the church until December. Um, in fact, what is today? Only a couple of days off of three years uh, today. And uh, I had requested, <laughs> actually it was more of a demand, uh, excommunication. Uh, it took me three months to get them to react to my request, as you saw from my letters. Yeah. first letter was written in August. Um, I left the church. I, I was saved in July, so there was almost a two-month period there um, before any action was taken or any reaction by the church. All of a sudden, I wasn't there anymore, you know. And they finally noticed, hey, you know, it's been eight weeks. Where is he? Yeah. <laughs> um, finally, my elders quorum uh, president came knocking on the door and said, I want to talk to you. And I said, come on in. And I explained to him what happened. And, and so uh, I requested excommunication. I, uh, in fact, I haven't been in a room with so many Mormons since that night. It's been <laughs> about uh, that long. And uh, it was by my request. I was... Uh, charged with apostasy, of which I freely admitted uh, being an apostate, uh, that there is nothing in the cardinal doctrinal system of Mormonism that I believe is true. Nothing. That's why I'm no longer a Mormon. People are Mormons because they believe what Mormons believe. I no, no longer believe what Mormons believe, so whether I was excommunicated or not is an administrative and academic situation. I'm not a Mormon. A Mormon is a Mormon because he believes certain things. A Christian is a Christian because he believes certain things. And uh, it's the belief structure that I take umbrage with. I certainly have no quarrel with the people. If I did, I wouldn't be here tonight at your invitation. And uh, I, I really don't have a vendetta against the church itself. They really never did anything to me that I could be mad at them about. Uh, you know, they didn't ruin my business or, you know, I got a letter just the other day from a doctor uh, who lives in Scottsdale, and he went through several pages, and I showed it to Steve today, and, 
And he kind of winds up by saying, obviously, you, somebody insulted you. That's why you left, was the implication. Am I doing justice to what he said, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that so many Mormons find it absolutely inconceivable that somebody leaves the church because he doesn't believe it anymore and believes something else. You know, I mean, I haven't gone into homosexuality. I'm not a murderer. I'm not in drug traffic. Uh, I don't have any tremendous heinous sin that I was kicked out for, okay? In other words, I was not kicked out. I had to say, hey, let me out of here, okay? I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I have the same sins that anybody else in this room has. The, the, sin, the gray sins of attitude and, you know, all this other jazz. But the real bad stuff of DNC 42, I, I can lay claim that I'm, I'm essentially innocent of. And... Um, I was not forced out for that purpose, which, of course, is one of the first things that comes into somebody's mind when they find out that I've, I'm an ex-Mormon or I've been excommunicated. You know, some, don't touch me, I don't want to catch it, whatever it is that you got. I mean, you know, and I'm not making, you know, I'm not yeah, trying to make scary. fun of it, but uh, I've, that's been uh, slid my way so many times, and, and so many others, too, that that have uh, taken another look at the New Testament, taken another look at Jesus Christ, and said, wait a minute, there's a difference here. And in comparison between what, what the New Testament sets forth in uh, the doctrine of Christ and what, what the Mormon Church and whatever variety you want to look at sets forth, there's a difference. This is, this is where I came to a certain point. Now, I was not totally active my whole ten years. I had my period as a Jack Mormon along with the majority of the church. As some of you may or may not know, 60% of the LDS church is inactive. Okay, by their own admission, I think it's more like 75% because I never was in a ward that had more than 25%. What number is decreasing, by the way? The activity or the inactivity? The inactivity. The inactivity. Uh, I 50% uh, well, I don't know. They said in, uh, I think it was September of this year in the church news, at 42%. They picked up 2%. Oh, dear. Henry Richards is interesting. Probably. Uh, well, I don't know who Henry is, but he may have been sliding you some wrong info. I got this right from the prophet. Uh, one of the talks he gave at BYU, and this is the one where he said that 20% of the boys go on a mission, you know, uh, which is only one out of five. And uh, I think that kind of patterns along my supposition that only about 25% of the church is active. And uh, particularly in the, the mission fields, I think you'll have a higher activity level in Mormon country than you will in Massachusetts and Florida and Illinois and places like that because there's not that tremendous pressure on you to conform and be there Sunday morning and Sunday evening and so forth. Um, but I had my first several years I was active, and my last two years I was active. Uh, and in between, I married this lady, praise the Lord for her, and uh, she put up with me. And I did everything in the book and out of the book, and possible, and conceived, and connived, and did all the things that one is supposed to do to socialize her into the church, because I really did believe it was true. And I wanted our family to be together, and you know, so forth and so on. Um, but I, uh, I was not re-evangelized into Mormonism because even though I was inactive for periods of time, uh, I had several doctrinal problems. I think the major doctrinal problem I had was the Negro question. I went through that whole bit, at least from where I was. I didn't have access to all the things that I know now, but just in reading pro-church literature about the doctrine on the Negro, where it was at, where it came from, and uh, a few things from the Utah Historical Quarterly and, and stuff like that, trying to put it together for myself doctrinally. Um, but anyhow, I always, I always said, well, there's something wrong with me. You know, I don't understand it right, or, you know, there's some kind of problem with my brain that certainly can't be the church's fault because the church is true and the doctrine is true and so forth. But anyhow, I reactivated myself voluntarily. They didn't even know I was there. By this time, I had moved through several states and wound up in Massachusetts. And I looked up in the yellow pages one day and called the bishop that I thought was the closest. And he says, no, call this guy. Both of them were 20 miles away. I mean, there's only still today, there's only one stake in the whole state of Massachusetts. And um, I mean, an award there is, oh, 200 square miles, you know. <laughs> 
Uh, so I, I called this bishop and I went down and I started going to church again and put the heat back on her to get her involved in the church and try to get her to take the lessons again and so forth. But all this time, <clears throat> I knew in my heart that I didn't have it together, if I might use that term, spiritually. Okay. Uh, I don't think anybody ever has it totally together. I'm not being naive here. I'm just saying that I, I, there, was, there was something missing. Now, it wasn't that I doubted the church. Uh, it was more of doubting myself. I mean, I, I just can't think of anybody in the state of Massachusetts, where I was at the time, who understood the Mormon gospel as well as I did. I mean, I really knew it. I hadn't been through the temple. I'd never been to the temple. Uh, but as those who in this room have been through the temple know that there's nothing really doctrinally new that you're going to get hit with in the temple. I mean, in terms of what the gospel is and, and so forth and so on. So uh, other than perhaps uh, not having, quote, a particular experience doctrinally, I had it all together. But I didn't have it all together. <laughs> I knew I wasn't right with God somehow and that I had to... I understood the doctrine well enough that I understood that be therefore perfect meant me. That I had to, quite literally, perfect myself. That the atonement of Christ on the cross paid only for Adam's transgression because he brought on full death to the world. Christ gave the resurrection to the world. And that anything beyond that, I mean, he opens up the door to us by the gospel and by our obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel that uh, we uh, uh, repent and therefore atone for our own sins, etc., etc. And that's how we get ourselves cleaned up because I kept remembering in the missionary lesson it said, no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that. I believe it now. Uh, it's just a matter of how you get clean and who does the washing uh, is, the, is the difference. I'm, I'm just going into this part of it so that you understand what I understood uh, to be the Mormon gospel because some people take umbrage with me on my point of view, so I just lay it out so if anybody wants to discuss it later, we can. And um, I was taught a number of things that a lot of Mormons say that they've never heard of before, which again would not shock anybody in this room that Jesus was married and quite probably a polygamist. The marriage of Cana was his marriage, and I did not get this from any fundamentalist material. I got it from priesthood meeting discussions right there in Tallahassee, Florida. And, uh, I mean, it, doctrinally, it's a, it, there's no way you can escape it. In the Mormon gospel, if Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, and he was sinless, and baptism is only the gate to the pathway to the highway to the off-ramp to get to the road to the celestial kingdom and that celestial marriage is the crowning ordinance of the Mormon gospel. There's just no way logically that, that a, a, I think a Mormon can escape having to face the fact that Jesus had to be married and that there are no unmarried gods. So uh, these are the t some, of the, some of the things that I was taught that the people say, well, you know, I don't know about that. But, uh, so I, I understood it doctrinally. I, I understood it quite well. But I also had enough in myself that I knew that I didn't have it together spiritually. And I've always been a pseudo-intellectual, and my pseudo-brains have always been getting in my way. And uh, I think that's one of the things that really had a tremendous draw and hold on me in, uh, in Mormonism, is that it seemed right. You know, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And so forth and so on. And all these different things seem to fit together for me and, and, and make sense and so forth and so on. But the Bible does say, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And uh, uh, I feel that when I look back, that the fact was that I was was looking for God. I was earnestly seeking God that uh, the Bible does promise us that those who do diligently seek Him will find Him. He will manifest Himself to Him. And um, what happened to me was that about two or three months before I got saved and renounced Mormonism, um, Karen had seen 
um, Pat and Shirley Boone on the Phil Donahue show. I think everybody's familiar with the Silver Fox of Channel 5. And uh, <clears throat> she was very interested in what they had to say as Christians because their marriage was almost destroyed and, and God put it all together for them. And the reason it was so interesting is that this problem, which had now become a serious problem of Mormonism and Christianity, um, had become a major problem in our marriage, uh, um, quite literally threatening the marriage existence. Because I wasn't about to recant because I understood the importance of being right with God. And so did she. And it seemed like a, a, a tremendous impasse. I wasn't about to give in and neither was she. And uh, I could talk her into anything except Mormonism. That's the, that's the buck stopped right there. Now, we've never been vocalizers or fighters or anything like that. Uh, uh, we're the kind of people who go into the war of attrition in ice cubes uh, for those who are married and are in that uh, particular uh, syndrome. You'll know what we're talking about. And I, uh, I, I, just can't, I just can't tell you that there was just no way to turn. Because, see, divorce was not an option with either of us. Murder, maybe. But divorce was not, okay? She comes from a, a Catholic background, and uh, um, uh, Mormonism didn't play any part in that, but I was just raised up by parents. It just, I mean, di I mean, divorce just didn't exist. It just was not an option. That's that, you know. Commitment is commitment, period, for better or for worse, until you can slip her some arsenic or something and not get caught. But, uh, so that was not an option. And... I never really seriously considered it, and of course, neither did she. But what this did, this forced me to consider one important fact that I look back on that I consider very important, that, is, that God really is in charge. That God is, in fact, a personal being who really does care about what's going on in my rotten life. And... Uh, I got to the point where I, I had given up on all my scheming and all the, uh, well, let's go down to the uh, whole corn and, and to the dance and go to Relief Society with, with my buddy's wife and all, you know, all this social stuff. And that uh, I kind of laid my cards out for the Lord. I said, if uh, this is your church, it's the true church. This is my wife. I don't want another one. This is the only one I want and we've got to be together. Uh, this whole religion thing, now this is of course a paraphrase, I was not, you know, angrily shaking my fist at heaven or anything. I'm just trying to give you the essence of what, what uh, I was asking the Lord. This whole religion thing is, is really yours. You know, I, I don't want to hassle about it, and neither does she, and, and Lord, if, if you want her in your church, then, then I just back out of it, back off, and you take care of her. And that's that. And the, the feat to that particular prayer was an agreement that I had made with her that if she would take the, the new lessons, by this time we had moved along to the post-1973 period, she would take the new missionary lessons and read what they asked her to read and do what they asked her to do and so forth. And at the end of the eight lessons, she didn't think it was the true church and Joseph Smith was a prophet. I would no longer hassle her about how the kids were going to be raised, whether they'd be raised in the Mormon church or in a Christian church. And I was just putting my, my cards down on the table for the Lord, saying, you want her in this church, you just take care of her. I, I wasn't even going to be at the, at the discussions. I didn't even want to be in the room, just her and and uh, a couple of people that she knew. I wasn't even going to use the young guys. I was going to use a couple of 70s that I knew in the ward and uh, take her time and so forth. No pressure, no, no heat. And I was sincere. I really meant this. The Lord knew it, and I knew that I knew it. Well, she never did get to take the first discussion. And I, I look at this in hindsight and say this was the turning point in my life is when I really finally got serious with God and made a commitment that was irrevocable. And uh, when I look back at that, and I, of course, 2020 hindsight is a very handy thing to have, you know. 
But I, I, just see, I just see God just moving right into my life at that point, and into hers as well, because this whole thing is, is really a joint. I'm just giving you my perspective on it tonight. Well, anyhow, uh, this whole uh, Pat and Shirley Boone thing on the uh, Phil Donahue show really got her all excited, and she wanted to read Shirley Boone's book, One Woman's Liberation. So uh, I went out to find it for her, and I stumbled into a Christian bookstore. Never knew there was such an animal, really. And uh, in fact, it was only a few days before that that I even knew that they existed because we saw Logos bookstore and needed a Chris, uh, what was it, birthday card for Mark. Mm -hmm. So we went into the bookstore to buy a birthday card, and there was all these Christian books and Bibles and stuff I'd never seen before. So I went back to the same store and uh, asked them, did you have this book by Shirley Boone? And she, oh, yes, and I got it. And I brought it home for her, and I, after supper I sat down and I started looking through it. Well, I wound up reading it. I'd finished it by the next day. I was very intrigued. And um, she had said a lot of things that I'd never heard. Uh, she had a perspective on Christ that I never realized. I was raised up as a Lutheran uh, in what I might term a nominal Christian environment. Um, all I remember is, is the difficulty in trying to stay awake during the 11 o'clock service. It was all right during Sunday school because we could talk, but um, there was just really nothing there. It never was for me. I'm not blaming the church or the pastor, you know. But um, so I went and I got Pat's book, which was about the same period of their life. It was his perspective on what happened in their lives. And I read through that. And again, I saw this consistency of uh, what they were saying about Christ. Well, it's a husband and wife deal, you know. Um, so I read some other books, mostly testimonial. Uh, but I saw a pattern emerge that I'd never seen before because my attitude as an LDS was that all the Christian churches taught all kinds of different doctrines. And uh, uh, I found out that there was a consistency about Christ no matter what denominational author I was reading. And this uh, got me back into another look at the New Testament. I had read it in the past two years of that time frame twice as a Mormon. And I went back and took another look. And making a long story short, uh, I saw that there was a tremendous difference between the Jesus of what I call Christianity and the Jesus of Mormonism. Uh, who he is, where he came from, what he is, what he did on the earth, why he came to the earth, what, what he did uh, during the Passion Week, what happened at the cross, and uh, the significance of what happened at the cross and how I relate to it and what happened after the resurrection and how I relate to it and its significance. So um, I really got to the point where I had to decide between the Jesus of Mormonism and the Jesus that I saw presented to me in the New Testament. And uh, I obviously chose the Jesus of the New Testament, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here as an ex-Mormon tonight. I'd probably be sitting over on the couch with you. Uh, listening to somebody else, perhaps, talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But uh, I think that's, I think that's the, the prime issue in uh, uh, the Christian's view of Mormonism is who is Jesus Christ and what did he do at Calvary. Uh, and the other flip side of that particular coin is uh, essentially the person and work of Joseph Smith. Um, things uh, there are a lot of side issues that people can, can get off onto, uh, but either Joseph Smith is what he said he was, and is the prophet of the restoration, and therefore we better listen to what he had to say. Or as Joseph Fielding Smith said, I think it was in uh, Doctrines of Salvation, it's the biggest fraud the world has ever seen. And there's no middle ground, according to Joseph Fielding Smith. And I, I think that's essentially the case. And that's why I'm no longer any kind of Mormon, nor would I ever be any kind of Mormon, because there is no middle ground. Because all of the groups of Mormonism look back to Joseph Smith. Only, I don't even have to get to Brigham Young, because if Joseph Smith was not what he claimed to be, then nobody else was either. And uh, I, I find it interesting that the uh, modern Utah church 
is trying to uh, submerge Adam, God, and, and uh, the other doctrines promulgated uh, by uh, uh, Brigham Young. But I think that they're all sourced in Joseph Smith. I think I mentioned this to you last week. Um, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I don't think Brigham Young had a single original theological thought in his life. And uh, I, I don't mean that uh, sarcastically. I think it's true. A lot of people uh, take pot shots at Brigham Young for Adam God. I don't think he picked it up off the ground. I think he got it from Joseph. And I'm sure that your research has been a lot more in-depth than that than mine. Do you believe that Joseph Smith was deceived? Do you believe he was a deceiver? I don't know. I have mulled that over in my mind so many times. Uh, I would tend to think, because of his early involvement with the occult, uh, the money digging and all the other activities of, of, that, of that nature, uh, that there's a possibility he was possessed, there's a possibility he was deceived, there's a possibility he was self-deceived. Um, I don't know. I don't think for one second that Brigham Young was deceived or self-deceived. I think he knew exactly who and what he was and what he was doing. Uh, not for one second. So I, 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 can, I can mull over in my mind you know, where Joseph Smith was in this type of regard, whether or not he was a deceiver or self-deceived. I think it's certainly obvious that he was in certain instances very much the deceiver. Um, I look at all of his public statements concerning plural marriage and where he's saying no, 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 and in privately he's running from house to house saying I do, I do, I do. And uh, 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 Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 14 uh, seals it for me. It says God's prophets do not prophesy lies. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the crowning uh, ordinance, at least for the large Mormon church, as opposed to the RLDS, is a celestial marriage, temple marriage, a plural or otherwise. I won't even get into that. But in the case of Joseph, it was definitely plural. I mean, you read D&C 132, uh, you might be able for the first 20 or 25 verses say, well, that's talking about one man and one woman. But then you got the whole rest of that section to contend with, which is exclusively, you know, the argument for wives and concubines and the threat against Emma if she didn't go along with it, and Abraham justified, and on and on it goes. And yet, uh, publicly, Joseph's running around, uh, cutting people off up in uh, Wisconsin and other places for uh, even breathing the fact that this was a church doctrine. I think it was uh, Joseph F. Smith who said in the Journal of Discourses that... Uh, uh, Oh, we got all, all kinds of clicks going on here. <laughs> that, I thought it was mine. Um, did you have a 60 or you have a 60 in there? See, I came prepared. I got 390s. Uh, don't worry, I won't use them all. Go ahead. You don't come over here just to sit on this Could somebody get me a drink of water or something? Uh, yeah, a little dry now. Um, but I, I don't think for one second that uh, that uh, Brigham Young had any illusions about who and what he was. Um, I find it interesting that it was one of the Pratts, I can't remember if it was Orson or Parley because they were both still around at the time. Uh, it was one of the Pratts who had the distinct honor of giving that first public lecture. Orson. Was it Orson? Okay. Um, yeah, that uh, that uh, finally announced to the world the uh, the glittering fact that uh, yay and verily yay we got more than one. And uh, I, I a lot of people uh, in in the the Christian side of the fence uh, take a lot of pot shots uh, at Mormonism for the practice of plural marriage uh, on biblical and also on moral grounds. Um, I never do that. I don't. I don't quibble with it. Um, I don't think that it's. I don't think it's biblical. I. I, I don't think it's at all biblical. Uh, but I won't argue the point. It's unnecessary to. Uh, I certainly don't attack it on moral grounds, uh, because uh, hopefully the. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The people were in fact married, and I will grant them the fact that they had no more uh, extramarital hanky panky than anybody else in, in monogamy or anything like that. I. 
I have difficulty with it because Joseph Smith lied about it. He lied about it in public. Um, did not lie about it in private. Uh, there's just, I think, an overwhelming amount of evidence that it definitely, or notwithstanding the position of the uh, reorganized church, uh, there is little doubt historically that Joseph Smith promulgated that doctrine. And that today it is viewed, in fact, uh, Joseph uh, F. Smith was the one who said that in the Journal of Discourses, I think it's volume 20, that uh, you people run around thinking that uh, you're obeying the law of celestial marriage by uh, being sealed in the temple to one wife. That's only the part of it. Uh, that's not the law. Yourself that's you yeah <coughs> so um, just on that point alone if I apply that one biblical what I call a biblical test Jeremiah 14 14 where God uh, makes it patently clear to anybody who wants to read and understand what he was saying that my prophets do not lie now that doesn't mean that they cannot be liars you know cheat on their income tax or something like that but they will not say yea verily gird up your loins thus saith the Lord blah, 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 and that's not the case. He just will not permit a true prophet to do that. And I think we have, uh, in the case of Joseph Smith, where in, uh, uh, in the public scene, he was denying it. And in fact, that was the reason he destroyed the expositor, uh, because uh, law came along and blew the whistle on him. Uh, not only on that, but on the... Um, of course, he argued with him about the plurality of gods, but that was just kind of a hassle, an in-house hassle. But he definitely blew the whistle on the plural marriage scene, as did Bennett, who was a scoundrel himself. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not taking Bennett's side, but uh, he, was, he was given the straight story. Uh, he might have embellished it a little bit, but the fact remains is that uh, they did teach it and they did practice it. And it also remains that uh, all of his public utterances we're vehemently denying it. And if I, don't, I wouldn't have to go any further as a Christian examining a man who claimed to be a prophet of God than that. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, uh, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, uh, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You know them by their fruits. How often we are uh, told to examine the fruit of the people, you know, uh, the good life, uh, the hearty handshake, a family home evening, uh, good neighbors. That's all well and good, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Um, we are to check the fruit of the prophet. The people who follow the prophet are not the fruit. It's what the prophet says that God says is the fruit. And um, he said it again in verse 20, uh, by their fruits you shall know them. And in verse 19 he says that uh, if there's a corrupt tree... If there's, if there's corrupt fruit on a tree, the whole tree is cut down, the tree is cut down and hewn down and cast into the fire. Uh, he didn't suggest that we pick off the good fruit uh, and then throw the, the uh, bad fruit away. Uh, he said the whole tree is cut down. Uh, we're not talking about people again, we're talking about prophets. And uh, uh, I think it's a, a weighty station for one to claim to be a prophet of God. And uh, certainly the, uh, the dozen that we have in the... Uh, uh, Utah Church and the others in the different branches of Mormonism are by no means the only people who have popped on the scene in the last couple of centuries saying, yea, verily, thus saith the Lord. We've got them all over the place. We just buried a few uh, from Guyana, okay? Uh, he not only claimed to be a prophet, he eventually was a god. He claimed to be God himself, I was reading today. And uh, I can believe that that's what he believed and told his people. So it's, it's a, a fairly common occurrence. I do believe we're in the last days. I do believe Christ is coming soon. Uh, and it's going to be a very exciting time around here very shortly. And we've got 5,000 tape recorders around here clicking. I have to put a special clicker on mine. I'm still going. i got, I got a C90. That must be yours over there, sir. But... Um, uh, there, are many, there are other tests of a prophet about false prophecy. Uh, a lot of people go into that. Um, I think uh, Joseph had several false prophecies. Uh, I'm not too impressed with a prophecy that comes to pass. Uh, I think the most famous, of course, is the Civil War prophecy, which is a, 
uh, touted quite heavily, and it was one that was used on me in 1965 with great effect, uh, having never looked at any kind of prophecy before. That was very impressive to me. Um, however, there are about six major points in that section, only one out of six, and uh, Deuteronomy 18 says uh, it's got to be uh, uh, 10 out of 10 or 1,000 out of 1,000. Uh, it's got to be right on all the time. And um, I think interestingly, I'll tell you an interesting story. About three weeks ago, I was looking for something in one of the drawers that we store old pictures and, you know, all that garbage that you never throw out and you're going to put in the album someday. And all those little reels of movie film that I took back to when and I've never put them together. We've never even looked at half of them. Well, in the bottom of that drawer, there was this old New York Times uh, genuine copy of it. I don't even know where I got it. I asked my wife. She it wasn't hers. It was obviously ours. It was in our drawer. And on the front page of this Maybe was... Maybe we lined the drawer. <laughs> yes, it might have been there with the original uh, drawer lining. There was an article about a gentleman in uh, uh, eight, the 1780s or something like that. Long. I mean, it just the country wasn't even a country yet. And, uh, or it was just forming during the Articles of Confederation. And this was uh, in 1863 with the Civil War raging, where he predicted that the North and the South would fight over the slavery issue, even before the Constitution was written. And, but that doesn't make him a prophet of God because he was right on something. It may do. Huh? It may do. It may do it? Yeah. No, the test of Deuteronomy 18 is actually a negative test. If the thing does not come to pass, well, and we can test it the other way too. You can, but you have to keep going. You have to apply the negative test. For an example, uh, Gene Dixon has been right about things. All kinds of people in the in the world of the cult and the occult. You have old Johnny Todd is right on some things, okay, trends and so forth. But that doesn't mean it came from God. Uh, also, in the realm of the supernatural, supernatural happenings. Uh, for 1500 bucks, uh, Guru Maharashi, uh, what's his face there in Iowa, the TM guy, will teach you how to levitate. Is that about right? Or is well, it 2000? Well, inflation. You know, uh, you too can levitate. And uh, a lot of these uh, characters running around over in India are performing all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean that the Lord God Jehovah has anything to do with them. And uh, um, so I think the real issue is whether or not Joseph Smith was a true biblical prophet. Um, many of the tests given in, uh, in the Bible are negative tests. Um, I think that uh, uh, those two are, are certainly the most important ones, uh, the false prophecy test and uh, the fact that he lied about something that you cannot consider a minor issue. Celestial and plural marriage is not a minor issue in Mormonism, even with the, the Utah branch, uh, which is temporarily suspended. It. They fully intend to do it as soon as they can. Uh, at least uh, Bruce McConkie does, definitely during the millennium. Okay, and uh, I knew that too. I never told her that. <laughs> so, uh, those are some of uh, some of the reasons. I think uh, Adam God comes into play. Um, did you get the chance to listen to the no, tape? Yeah. I mentioned it to them. Okay. Uh, uh, I appreciate your uh, review, if you would, please. Well, I won't go into any great detail since it's already on tape, and uh, you know. But uh, here's how I view it. Um, I think it applies in the test of a prophet. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 does tell us that uh, if a prophet comes, even with signs and wonders but says, let's go after uh, another god that thou hast not known. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Actually, uh, the in invocation there is to uh, rock him to sleep outside the city walls. And, the, of course, the penalty uh, was death by stoning. And, um, you know, I don't know where everybody is in terms of Adam, God, and which side of the fence you're on and so forth. It, it really doesn't make a, trem uh, uh, a tremendous amount of difference because... Uh, from the perspective of the the big church, okay, the one with all the money, uh, repudiating now the doctrine, 
and it's definitely a repudiation. There's no way that uh, it can be considered any longer a shelving or a side issue. When uh, Kimball came out two years ago and said, uh, I warn you against this and other kinds of false doctrine on the Adam God, what he called a theory, uh, there's no, no way out. I mean, he has declared categorically in English, a language I understand somewhat, does not have to be translated for me, that it is false doctrine. No ifs, no ands, no buts. The interesting thing, uh, uh, poor Mr. Kimball, derives his authority directly from the public source of Adam God, Brigham Young. The man who ordained Kimball uh, was ordained by Brigham Young. So his line of authority stops at the man who's, who is at least publicly the source of Adam God. And, uh, <clears throat> but that's his problem. Uh, yes, quite literally, except he's got his, uh, 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 he's got control of the corporations now. There's nothing that Brigham can do one way or the other. But I mean, in the, in the spiritual realm, um, his, his line of authority is cut off right there because if Brigham did teach it, even if he wasn't the source for it, but if he just taught it, as I say he taught it, and as several in this room know he taught it, no way around, then, and, excuse me, Spencer Kimball has declared him, has declared that idea to be false doctrine about God, Deuteronomy chapter 13 ends the issue as far as those two are concerned. That is, Brigham taught false doctrine about the nature of God. Deuteronomy declares him to be a false prophet. Okay? And if he is a false prophet, and we will assume that he taught Adam God, then everybody who comes after him is wiped out, gone. Because with the exception of John Taylor, every president since then has derived his authority from Brigham Young. The buck stops at Brigham. And those of you who know about rebaptism and the reordinations that happen in the valley, essentially the entire church was reorganized by Brigham Young under his authority. Um, now, we still have the question of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, in other words, the fundamentalist position, that uh, that is the true doctrine, and that it was that which was taught by Joseph, and so forth and so on. That's a whole different perspective on what Adam God is. The only perspective I usually deal with myself is the presupposition that Adam is not our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Now, I will give the fundamentalist position one A+. Plus. They are the only ones that are consistent within the law of eternal progression. Because that is, if, if Joseph did not teach Adam God, he would have had to because that's where he was heading in his evolutionary theological uh, attitudes. Uh, we start off with the trini modal Trinitarianism of the Book of Mormon. The Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father. Okay? And then by 1835, we've got a little drift in the lectures on faith. We have a personage now called the Father, who is uh, glory, power, and spirit and a personage of tabernacle known as the Son. And these two are the Godhead with the Holy Ghost, not the Spirit, but the Holy Ghost being their mind. By the time we get to the late 1830s, 1840s, and at the end of his life, he's multiple polytheistic, that uh, God was once a man, and we can become gods ourselves. But in the, uh, in the scheme of the eternal progression thing, uh, and now I'm stepping back to when I was a Mormon. I was taught that Adam and Eve could not have children before the fall. They were, quote, innocent, unquote. Nobody explained to me what that meant, you know, what innocent meant. That meant that they couldn't have children. Well, uh, this whole scheme of Adam-God theologically puts it together because it explains why they were innocent and how they became uninnocent. I'm not saying it's true, by no means, but I'm saying logically consistent, the, uh, the position is there. Now, my position is uh, what might, one might call the evangelical Christian position, the Trinitarian nature of God, 
uh, which is certainly not tritheistic nor polytheistic. But again, the buck comes back to Joseph Smith. You see, if Joseph Smith was a true prophet, then I'd, we have to pay attention to at least one of the Mormon groups, or uh, perhaps a combination of them, I don't know, whichever way you want to put it. But if Joseph Smith was not a true prophet, the bottom line is that we shouldn't pay attention to anything theologically. I mean, culturally, you sure, you know. I, I think Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, too, are uh, fascinating historical characters, no question of that. Uh, but theologically, I have nothing to do with them. I don't want anything to do with the fruit off the tree of doctrine that they set forth. I'm not quibbling with them necessarily as persons. I'm only concerned with the fruit, the doctrine that they set forth as alleged prophets of God. And the reason that I, quote, fight against Mormonism, unquote, is because my pr bottom line is this, is that Mormonism is not true because Joseph Smith was not a true prophet. He fails the biblical tests of a prophet. His doctrine, therefore, is corrupt. It's axiomatic. Is I, I don't have any option in taking some of it with the... I don't need any of it. Because if Joseph Smith was not a true prophet, I don't need the Book of Mormon. I certainly don't need the DNC or the Pearl of Great Price or any of the discourses that have flowed out since then. And that the position of restoration of a lost organization is not a true position, which actually he just swiped from Alexander Campbell in the first place. Uh, it was not an original thought with him. Campbell was running around ten years ahead of him talking about restoration and uh, the whole business, so it really wasn't even unique to Joseph. So my, my, uh, my summary then is this, that in examining Joseph Smith on those points of false prophecy, nature of God, um, and certainly the aspect of prophesying lies in the name of Jehovah, uh, he is declared to me to be a false prophet. But that's not why I left Mormonism. That's uh, kind of a look back at the, the reasons I would give somebody, uh, scripturally, intellectually, or any other way you want to uh, talk about it, why Mormonism is not Christian. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing for somebody to get up and say it's not Christian as a system. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, but you better have some reasons for it, scripturally and, and historically. Uh, you know, anybody can sit around taking pot shots. That Johnny Todd does that very nicely, going around taking pot shots at different individuals and calling them names and, and having no proof and no reasons for it. Um, my reason for leaving is I encountered Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus Christ, in, uh, uh, in an experience, okay, we, we could sit around and swap experiences all day long, okay, various feelings one might talk about or manifestations or anything, but if a manifestation or an experience occurs to me that is not in line with what the scripture has to say, then I know automatically that I rebuke that manifestation in the name of Jesus Christ and cast it out of my presence. And I don't care what it says or what it does. The angel of light warning we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And again in uh, Galatians chapter 1. Even if an angel out of heaven comes down and preaches to you another gospel, let him be accursed. And uh, so that I don't seek an experience to confirm scripture, which is essentially what we're asked to do in Moroni 10.4, after you read this book, pray about it, seek an experience, spiritual experience, to confirm to you that this is in fact from God. That's, that's backwards. That's the wrong way around. I go to what I know to be the Word of God and check my experiences against it. Okay? See, I'm going from the Christian perspective because most of the missionaries come to Christian homes that already have this book and accept this book. And they want to bring a second witness to this book. And to confirm that witness by a spiritual manifestation. The spiritual manifestation, no matter how uh, convincing it is to us personally, if it doesn't square up against what the scripture has to say, I would have to uh, uh, declare it null and void. And this is, this is what, I, uh, what I try to share with, with different uh, uh, Mormons, is to test it scripturally. Okay? Uh, test all things hold fast to that which is good.
and not get into a hassle on different minor points of doctrine and so, because it's 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 really root source is the uh, is the question and the issue and the root source is Joseph Smith not even Brigham Young um, actually Brigham and his teachings are, are kind of a secondary issue because <laughs> There's no way that he can be a true prophet if Joseph was a false one. So if I examine Joseph, and biblically anyhow, find him to be a false prophet, it stops right there. The rest of it is just an interesting uh, cultural uh, uh, experiment in America. But it's certainly not the true church, the true and living church, or any variation of it is the true and living church restored by Jesus Christ. And they would fall into the category of those where Jesus would say, depart from me, I never knew you. So that's kind of a summary of some things. I'd, if anybody would like to ask questions, or we can go around. Or yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. You talked about full marriage, that Joseph taught that it was a doctrine of the church. No, he didn't teach it was a doctrine of the church, because it wasn't. It never was a doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Uh, although some of the members who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ also incorporated that doctrine. Well, um, if I did say, if I used the words doctrine of the Church, uh, they were misnomers, and I repent of saying that, because it was not doctrine of the Church, because in order to be doctrine of the Church, it would have had to have been publicly known. Okay. Uh, this was a doctrine that he promulgated. Yes. Okay, privately. Mm -hmm. Okay, and said it came from God. I mean, if you read DNC 132 uh, and assume that it came from Joseph's pen, and I'm convinced that it did, uh, it certainly was not Brigham Young style. All you have to do is read uh, uh, his revelation. What is it, 136, 135? I think it's 136. Yeah, that's right. It's just before the manifesto. Um, it's, uh, DNC 132 certainly uh, was not penned by Brigham Young. No, it was not doctrine of the church. That's the thing I'm taking umbrage with. Okay, okay so what's the problem with, with plural marriage? Or why, why can you say Joseph Smith was a false prophet because, because of plural marriage? Because publicly he said he denied it publicly. Right. He said, I am not teaching this thing. I am accused of having more than one wife. I do not have one wife. We do not teach any such doctrine here. And he excommunicated people who got caught at it. Okay. okay, and privately he's saying this is the this is the gateway to heaven. This is the way you get to become a god, and that this comes from God. Okay, so he, right. was, he was teaching one thing privately and saying another thing publicly. Right, but that's he didn't say I'm not teaching privately such and such. Uh, many people knew he was, and, and they and the, the, the majority didn't, but. Uh, but he didn't say. Well, well he he made in, he made references to the church. The church knows no such doctrine. The church didn't know it. It didn't belong to the church. Uh, only in so much as some of the all the individuals who were into that were also in the church. Yeah, but uh, I think personally, you know, I I understand your perspective. Okay. Yeah. And, and I won't take umbrage with your perspective. I'll just clarify my own. Um, let's get away from Joseph Smith for a second and take a look at uh, Richard Nixon. Okay. Privately, he knew darn good and well what was going on. Okay. And that it was his henchman with his approval and, in fact, with his orders. And publicly, he's saying, let's get the scum out of here. There's something wrong. I don't know what's going on, but we'll get under, you know... Uh, we're not doing anything. We're no, nobody in the White House is guilty of this. You see this? See the pattern? See now, when I look at uh, Richard Nixon, I, I think of only one. Uh, it's a liar. You know, he's not telling the truth. He knew, and he knew that he knew that he knew, and he got on national TV and said, "I don't know. I'm innocent." I don't know. There's a scripture in the New Testament that says, and, and you might explain this to me why this would appear in the New Testament, uh, being as it's scripture. Uh, when thou art in thine, when thou art in the way, agree with thine adversary, lest he esteem thee to be thine enemy, and cast thee in, in prison. Basically, is what it boils down to. Now that looks like to me, Christ is saying, lie if you have to. <laughs> mm, no, I'd, I'd have I'd have to check that. I've not 
seen that nor had it brought up to me in that that okay. form. You familiar with that one, Steve? No, I have to see it in the context. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah the, the thing that, the thing that <coughs> comes to my mind is the quote that was in the Times and Seasons. I believe it was in the Times and Seasons. It says, I've been accused of having more than one wife. History of the church. I can only find one. And at that time, he had at least eight. Sure. Or well, more. you gotta, you got to remember, Joseph Smith was, was speaking... Lawyer talk. I mean, John Bennett had influenced him quite a quite a bit, and he thought that it was it was it was smart to to speak in such a way that you could you could say the truth and and, and get around it. And so he gets up in court and he says, "I'm accused of being a polygamist," and I look around me and all I can see is but one wine, and which in a strict sense is true. Uh, when, when you're talk, when you're talking from a legalistic sense, but when you're talking from a when, when you're talking from a from a moral sense or an ethical sense of what you're doing, then you're saying his intent is to deceive the people. Okay, but you see, he may not have he may not have understood things in quite that in quite that way. Well, now to me though, we're dealing with a man who has direct communication with Almighty God. Yes, but you see, there's a lot of people that have direct communication with Almighty God. Now, for instance, there's there's one man that we consider we can, that most of us consider to be a prophet of God, and and that's Peter, and he denied Christ three times, and yet went on to be one of the major figures in the in in the establishment of the of the church, and 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 we wonder we we wonder. Um, how it could be such a sin for one man to acknowledge as Jesus as his Lord, who is Judas, as we recall, and not to be such a terrible sin for a man to to deny him when the going got <coughs> rough. You know, I really don't think I really don't think that because a man uh, appears to uh, appears to 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 be deceivable, uh, de deceiving or deceitful, that that's an honest test of a true prophet. I think that the other well, tests are okay. better tests. All right. Uh, well, the other tests are. I mean, I'm not putting all the basket all the eggs in one basket. Okay. The, you know the other tests come into play. Okay, all right. Let's, let's look Wait a second. Wait, well, let's go back to what you said. I, I want to speak to the point of your illustration. Uh, if you remember, I said that I will allow Joseph Smith to be a liar, <coughs> but I will not allow him to prophesy lies, because that's what the test of Jeremiah 14:14 14, 14 is. Okay, is to prophesy lies. The word prophesy means to speak for another. Okay. When Peter denied Christ, he was in the flesh. And he was afraid for his skinny little Jewish body, okay. And 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 I, I I don't even take any any issue with Joseph Smith for putting up a fight in the Carthage jail, okay, with the mob coming at him. All right, I I, I won't allow him to be a martyr, because that's not exactly willing. All right, it's not exactly going to your death willingly. But but I, I won't take uh, you know issue with him for that. I'd probably do the same thing if if they were coming after me. And, and in in the case of Peter. Uh, he's got all these angry Jews running around. I'll allow him to lie about knowing Christ, but he's not prophesying in the name of God on the crowning ordinance of the Mormon gospel well, did, to the public. Did Joseph Smith. He didn't say, I say by the name of Israel's God that floral marriage is, is a heinous crime. He did not say that. Yeah, well, I think he never spoke in the name of God denying floral marriage, never once. Well, uh, then we get into the thus saith the Lord syndrome. You know, did he say thus saith the Lord? Well, well he did other times. Uh, there, well, I mean, if you have to say thus saith the Lord in order to speak as God's representative, then we're going to have a lot of trouble with a lot of things called Scripture because there's not that many comments prefaced with a, yea, verily, thus saith the Lord. Well, okay. in Mormonism there is. No, there's, in fact, there's about 13 sections of the DNC that aren't even claimed to be revelations, much less having a thus saith the Lord. Uh, DNC 130 is an example, which is just nothing more than the notes of the, the lecture that he gave that day, and so forth and so on, and other things. Uh, the man, well, I'm not even counting the manifesto, I'm just the actual, out of the 136 sections, there's about 13 
that I've counted that the heading says, you know, what, a, an what epistle or something. What thus saith the Lord situations do you, do you find fulfills this this uh, definition of a false prophet? You mean uh, which uh, prophecies, for example? Is that what you're talking about? That didn't come true. Well, I think the case of David W. Patton is something that has to be observed. Well, in refresh our memories. All right, section 114. Somebody have a DNC. Uh, could read section 114. It's easy. There's only two verses. Okay. The. Uh, well, I don't want to get into a lot of deep context, man. You've got to keep it simple if we can. Um, David W. Patton was, I think, the number two man in the original Council of the Twelve. At least that's the way he's listed in the church news and all. Uh, Marsh was the number one man. I think by this time frame, uh, Marsh was already in some trouble because it was only a year later they kicked him out. Um, and uh, in this revelation here, and it is considered a revelation, isn't it the heading read that way? Yes. Okay. Uh, why don't you go read it? There's only two verses. Early thus saith the Lord, it is wisdom in my servant David W. Patton that he settle up all his business as soon as he possibly can and make a, def a disposition of his merchandise that he may perform a mission unto me next spring in company with others, even twelve including myself, himself, to testify of my name and bear glad tidings unto all the world. For, but, for verily thus saith the Lord, that inasmuch as there are those among you who deny my name, others shall be planted in their stead and receive their bishopric. Amen. Okay. okay. What is the problem with that? David W. Patton never went on that trip. Okay. Okay. That was a prophecy, and it's also tied into a, was it 121, Steve? Section? One eight, section it's tied into section 118. Okay. Calling that 12 to go on that mission. Right. It, the, there's a tie in there with section 118 where they were specifically to leave from the uh, uh, far west on the 26th of June following. Can, okay. Can, can I show you a parallel for that? Um, God, by revelation, as, as some of us believe, called Abraham to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. And yet, uh, something happened before Isaac was actually sacrificed that caused the Lord to change his mind. We yeah. don't know that. That's when what you the go back, When you go back and read the account of, um, of the whole scheme of the, the sacrificing of Isaac, um, especially when you go back to the original Hebrew and read it. There is some indication, no hard and fast, but there is some indication that the sacrifice, okay, may, the knife may have already been plunged, but that there was some degree of resurrection. I'm not saying that to be the case, but there is some indication there. But the whole thing about it is, in, in regard to Abraham sacrificing Isaac, okay, he was going to do it, he was prepared to do it, but he knew Number one, something was either going to happen or God was going to resurrect Isaac. Because God had promised that in your seed, this seed, Isaac, shall all the nation of the world be blessed. If he had cut him off, he couldn't have done that. Well, the, that destroys the whole point of the story. Now, let, let's get back to this, this, this thing that perhaps, perhaps there's a problem in the Hebrew. Okay, that, or there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's something in the Hebrew that will let us look at that story with another life. Right. Okay. But one thing that we've got to do is we've got to read that story through the eyes of those people who, who wrote it. Right. Who Abraham. understood the Hebrew. Uh, through Abraham. And there were more than there were more than just the author of that particular story in Genesis. There are many, many versions of that particular story that exist. And the story that you tell, that, that, that you would like to see come out of the Hebrew, is not told in any of these paraphrases. Any of them. Right. It's, it's not something that you could put your faith in. Let me put it that way. I'm just saying there was, there was some degree of... of but, but yet these men understand Hebrew a lot better than you and I. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, there's another problem with this as far as saying it's a false revelation or a... Yeah, basically that's what it boils down to. False prophecy is okay. my premise. Uh, the Lord can say, I'll call so-and-so to go on a mission. 
But that doesn't mean he's going to force him to go. That man still has his free agency. He can say, mm -hmm. I got other things to do. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a, <clears throat> a problem in the case of David Patton. Uh, when I've showed this to various people, they say, well, he uh, free agency thing, you know, he probably uh, uh, fell out of the faith or, you know, wasn't valiant or, or something like that. But the uh, fact is he was killed. That he was killed. Yeah. And he was called the first martyr of the Restoration. And the history of the church records the, uh, Joseph Smith saying at his death that he died as he lived, a man of God faithful to the end. Paraphrase, but that's essentially what it was. Um, and just looking at it, it, what it is, it's short, it's sweet, it's to the point. It concerns him and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. No other group is involved. All right, That they're go going to go into the mission to the world, not to the spirit world. Uh, you really have to stretch it and stick that right in there because they did go. Well, I think that's All right. fair. They, they did go. go. The spirit world. Huh? I mean, I mean, this, it obviously is trying to imply something other than the spirit world, and I think that that's twisting it to, to try to force it into that, into that mold. Uh -huh. I agree with that. But I think that when you say that, aha, uh, this particular uh, desire on the part of the Lord was not fulfilled, I think that you will find many parallels through, through the Bible. No, uh, I and, and uh, uh, I know what you're thinking. I know some of the things you're thinking of. Okay, but regardless of how the Hebrew might read, or the intention of the story, or our lack of scholarship in those areas, if we're not in agreement that Deuteronomy chapter 18 is fairly dogmatic in the area of false prophecy as a negative test, okay. In other words, it is a negative test that is to be applied. The, the Hebraic Talmudic tradition was they did apply it uh, when they were not in a state of severe apostasy, which was fairly frequent. But this was God's standard. This was a way, by the way, God's people would know that this man was from God. Well, I agree. Okay. You know, I think that that's a. I think that's an important point. But you see, you can take that. You can take that test that 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 Moses issued, and I think most of us assume that that was from God. I do. Uh, and you can apply that to the Old Testament prophets, and you discover, lo and behold, you're hard put to find one Old Testament prophet whose prophecies have all been fulfilled. You'd really be hard pressed. Well, we don't have. Most we don't. Of them we're looking for <coughs> some time in the future, and you talked about this. this ah, but you see, we're we're not dealing with the live prophets in the written record. The test was for those then alive. In other words, the test is not the test is not applying to the dead generations. Well, All right. Joseph Smith is just okay. as dead as Isaiah. Well, not according to most uh, not according to most missionaries. They keep telling me he is a prophet of God. The way most of them talk, you know, he's alive today. Okay. I know I know what you, I know what you're saying. I know, and I know what you mean. And I think you know what I mean. Okay, right. is that the test is for those of us who are alive when somebody comes, yea, verily, thus saith the Lord. You know, we've got one of two things. We either pay attention or we ignore him. All right. Okay. And, now, and wait a minute, let me finish. And if we ignore him, we do it at our own jeopardy if he is a true prophet. Okay. And if we pay attention to him and he's a false prophet, we're again in our own jeopardy. So God has given us the standard whereby we might know that a man who comes to us and says, I speak for God, whether it's Jimmy Jones, Joseph Smith, Reverend Ike, or anybody else running around saying, you know, I am God's mouthpiece, and there are plenty running around, sure. okay, and have been for a long time, sure. uh, that this is the standard by which I personally might begin to examine a person. But, but let, let me give you an example. Could one I, very could famous. Could I interject one thing? <laughs> Excuse me. I can go on. Rather than trying to reconvert this man, could we have him answer some other questions? Well, I, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to reconvert him. I oh, think well, that. Not to me. I, I I I I have some questions of my own, you know, and and I feel like I feel like that that when when Joseph Smith is 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 put up. Uh, 
to be measured to see whether or not he's a, he's a real prophet. We ought to well, then we ought to measure right. him along with the same standard that some of the others have been measured. I now, that's valid. One, uh, for instance, one thing, one thing, uh, one prophecy that I that I remember that is that is uh, really well known among the among the Christians is the prophecy in Ezekiel about the seventy weeks. He gave that prophecy seventy weeks later. It was not fulfilled. The Christians, after... Wait a minute, the Hebrew doesn't say weeks. It doesn't. No. What does right? it say? It just says times. I don't know of and the prophecy Ezekiel 70 weeks. I think he's thinking of Daniel. Yeah, I, I knew what he meant. Ezekiel's in weeks also. Ezekiel's in weeks. Again, I'd have to go back and look at it. <clears throat> well, it's, 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 it's uh, fairly well known. Daniel is quoting from the prophecy of Ezekiel. Daniel gives it in times. There's, there's all kinds of prophecies of the coming of Christ where, where, where Isaiah, for instance, is, is uh, prophesying of the coming of Christ and you, you get the idea that, that, that he's going to be born next week. Who is it? Hosea that, that, that names uh, uh, two of his bastard sons uh, uh, some unusual thing or another to indicate the coming of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you read that, literally, <coughs> you've got problems. Although they were fulfilled, they weren't fulfilled, jot and tittle, as, as some of us who, who would really want to put the Lord in the barn would have Him, would, would have him fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know the difficulty there. Okay, we got started on another thing. <laughs> no, I don't. We were started on this first. Can we go oh, back to geez. it? <laughs> okay, I mentioned the scripture about agree with thine adversary quickly whilst Wh thou where are you? in the way with him, lest at any time the, the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. That's Matthew 5.25. Now, <coughs> why would you agree with your adversary in the wayside when you wouldn't at other times to avoid being put into prison? Is that not deception? And if that is deception, did, did Christ at times sanction deception? Did Christ do things behind the backs of the public that, that the public didn't know about? Mm -mm. Then why did he take the, the a few choice brethren up to the Mount of Transfiguration and tell them, you don't talk about this? <laughs> but the point is, is you've got it here. You know what happened. It's all recorded right here. Yeah. Okay. So what are you saying? I'm saying that the fact that you know that he went off with a couple of guys at his particular place and discussed things with them is recorded here. There's no secrecy about it. There's, there's a tremendous there secrecy. There was then. There is. There's this business about having to speak in parables. Why? Why couldn't he? Be, why couldn't he speak to the people plainly as he spoke to the twelve? Okay. Right? The all right. The other difficulty I have with it, all right, is the perspective of seven dispensations of restoration. Okay, that celestial marriage is not something new. At least that's the way I was taught. I don't know about the people it's around not here. New. Okay. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, that this was actually its sixth time around. Depends on how you want to count the seven dispensations and all, all right? Um, and that actually it's uh, supposedly backed up by the uh, the Bible and all. Why all of the secrecy? What's the, what, okay. about the marriage? Yeah, it's kind of hard to hide several wives in a house that's only supposed to have one. All right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you say it's only supposed to have one? Well, if you're if you're if you're if you're not it, if you're not admitting that you're doing this and you're keeping it from the public. To who? When? Nauvoo? Wherever you want. I, I think that answers your question right there. The people were not ready for that. Now Brigham Young was of the same feeling that you are in that respect. He says, "Hey, it's the gospel. Why hide it?" But, but for obviously good reasons. I mean, we look at the story of Joseph Smith, and obviously, for good reason, 
Joseph Smith had something to hide. I mean, after all, he was killed for it. He died as a result of as, as a result of it being revealed. Mm, I think that that's a little hard pressed. Well, you know, it, it well, had, but it had an influence. We, the way he reacted to the exposure of it, I think, was more influential than the actual exposure of it. Well, I mean, because there. Whatever there was. Yeah. There, I don't know that. I don't know that that pieing somebody's type is justification for death. You know. No, no, I, I never, I would never say that. Okay, okay. I'm, well, I'm not yeah. saying that that for that particular thing uh, uh, that he deserved to die. Nobody deserves to be lynched by anybody. Yes, but on the other hand, you, you've got to remember that there was a time in Joseph Smith's life where he was about to be castrated because he was fooling around with with the sister of one of the apostles, and uh, having gone through that process. And at the last minute, having the doctor weasel out of his commitment to the to the Johnson sisters or brothers, and then getting tarred and feathered instead, I would suspect that being faced with the same situation, he was apt to lie about it. Well, and then we uh, can compare that to to <coughs> Peter. He was he was afraid for his physical well-being at a particular point in time. As you mm -hmm. pointed out, but he no. didn't say the Lord God. The Lord God told me that, that this is all false. Well, you, there, I think there's a little bit difference between Peter and Joseph. Peter was in the armed camp of the enemy alone, and Joseph was in charge of the Nauvoo Legion, and he was the most powerful man in Illinois. It's debatable because at the head of the Nauvoo Legion were two men who had as much, if not more, influence than Joseph Smith. The one was William Law, and the other was John Bennett. John Bennett, William Law, was the one that really pissed mm. And, and John, John Bennett tried to get him killed once in a sham battle. There's some Mormon folklore to the extent that Joseph Smith could not trust his, his, his own militia, not because they were dishonest men, but because they were being deceived into practicing a particular field movement that was oh, wait a minute. Excuse Smith. me. When when did Bennett leave the scene? Wasn't that in forty two? I thought it was forty two. Forty three. I think it was forty three. I thought it was a little earlier than that. It was after the Holy Order initiation in forty two. Well, there was left. there was twice. He left and then he yeah, came back. Yeah, three four months. William later. Law. William Law left in the in the spring of forty four. Yeah, I knew that was right concurrent with the expositor uh, episode came on shortly after that. We got There's another another incident in the Old Testament. One chap says he he's got a good looking wife and he's going to go into Egypt and he says, "Hey, uh, we might have problems." He says, "I got a suggestion. If they ask, you say you're my sister." That's right. Abraham was a liar, no doubt of it. You wasn't a prophet. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Because he was not prophesying a lie. There's a difference there. And I and I give that to Joseph Smith or anybody else who's a prophet. Okay, the ability to sin. Okay? Well, we talked but, about uh, Jesus Christ being being married or not. And leading me to believe that you did not believe that. That there was no reason to believe it uh, apart from Mormonism. That is, that is my position. There is no reason to believe that apart from okay, Mormonism. We have a famous physician. Celsus of the first century after Christ, he taught that Christ was married. We have statements by Joseph, Josephus, Clavius, Josephus. Uh, we've got Jewish law that before before they could go out and preach, they had to be married, responsible men, and of a certain age. And have children. Now, how did he? How did he get? A yes, and have, have, children. have children. You bet. Yeah, that was a Jewish part of Jewish law. Jewish how did they law. overcome that? I don't know. I said I don't know. Okay, well, these were All right. points to ponder. But I'm not, I'm not arguing the position, yay or nay, whether Christ was married or not. Okay, I'll drop the Okay, I'm not dogmatic on that, you know. Right. I don't believe he was. I don't, I don't see any reason in Scripture to believe he was. Um, after all, he is God. This is his world. He can do anything he wants to, no matter what the Jews did. No, he's bound by law. <laughs> no, I, you, you said you, another point that, that you brought up that... That kind of touched me mm -hmm. was yes. that you felt Besides, that, yeah, I'd have to that it up. everything Kelsey, hinged upon Kelsey, Joseph yeah, Smith. I believe that, that, that it does too. And his uh, are, are however, I don't believe 
that that because one man sins or two or a dozen men sin that the salvation of the whole a uh, 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 whole group of people is 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 lost now for instance if if uh, president kimball sins in the in in denying adam god uh, I don't believe that it necessarily ties the whole church into the bind of of having lost their salvation because because he had apostatized. Or Brigham Young, if Brigham Young apostatizes in in doing or not doing or saying or not saying a particular thing. Uh, I don't think you can hold that to the rest of the Mormon people unless they are. Unless they are doing it in in, in uh, the, the the same using using the same test as, as Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith says he received it as a as a revelation. Uh, Spencer W. Kimball says that he received a revelation regarding the the priesthood and the Negro. Well, suppose Joseph Smith. You see, in my opinion, it's very likely that President Kimball fulfills the prophecy, and I hope I don't Go ahead. hurt anybody's Go ahead. feelings or step on anybody's toes, fulfills the prophecy of the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, where they're looking for a son of perdition to come and sit over, or rule over the temple of God. That prophecy, I have a hard time explaining outside of the context of, of Mormonism. Uh, I've heard some people say, well, the temple of God is your body, and there's going to be a son of perdition that's going to, that's going to do terrible things to his body and things like that. But, but No, I think that the temple, well, we get into a lot of... Oh, what, uh, you tell me what you thought, I can tell you what I think. I think the temple, there will be a temple built in Jerusalem where the Jews will reinstitute animal sacrifice. So okay. But, and, and, and the fulfillment of second, of that second chapter, second Thessalonians will be... The temple in Jerusalem. But the Lord is going to acknowledge that temple as being his temple prior to this time. Is that what you're saying? No. I'm not saying that he's going to acknowledge it. I'm just saying that the Jews are going to do it. But Paul okay. is acknowledging that that temple is the temple of God. Well, uh, are you saying that God has to uh, accept this temple? Because, see, there is it's only... Uh, it's the temple of God or it's not. Well, there's only one temple, okay, in Jerusalem, on one particular piece of land in Jerusalem. And when they build another temple there, that is, that, there's, that's the only temple there is. There is no other temple. Well, there I, never has I, been another I temple. With that. I know you do. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just showing you that it's not necessarily that you have to look at Second Thessalonians 2 only from the perspective of okay. Spencer Kimball in right the Salt now, Lake Temple. Right now, on that on that piece of land, there is a temple. It is called variously as the Mosque of Omar. Yeah, but it's not the, the Jewish. Mosque. It's not built by the Jews, though. Well, maybe that fulfills that same prophecy. No, I don't think so. I think it's too literal. I think the Jews have to do it. The Jews have got Jerusalem back after 2,500 years. Yes, and 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 I agree with you. It's got, except that I go a little further. In order for that for that prophecy to be fulfilled, God has got to acknowledge that as His temple. I mean, I don't care if you if you want well, to he's the I, temples. I, I, in America and say that they're not... Well, I, all I'm, the only reason I'm hesitating on that is I don't think that God is going to accept the purpose for which the temple is built by the Jews, and that's for animal sacrifice. Okay. So it was before. Yeah, but it, that's not... That, so from that, from that standpoint, I would not say that, that it would be, quote, the temple of God in the context that you're saying. But see, even Jesus acknowledged that. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge what? What? that the temple of God as containing animal sacrifice was was still a house of, of his father. Sure, the he kept the Sabbath day Sabbath too. Well, sometimes because he kept he, it and sometimes he, he was made under No, the he, he kept it all the time. Okay, the only thing he ever... No, well, the Pharisees accused him of breaking their tradition. That's not breaking the law of the Sabbath. 
you know. Uh, because if he did break the law of the Sabbath, uh, Sabbath, then he did sin. And the scripture says quite plainly, he did not they were, sin. They were convinced that he was, well, I mean, sure, you know. That's my perspective, anyhow. I'm sure that there was somebody around Joseph Smith that would have said that he didn't sin either. You see, it's very easy to have a witness say, uh, gee, this guy that I worship over here, he didn't sin. Well, do you believe that Jesus sinned? Do I believe that he sinned? Yes. I don't know that he's. I regard Jesus as my Savior, and I believe that He came and He atoned for my sins personally. And see, this is the this is the miracle. This is the miracle that I see. A man gave up his life in a situation that it was hard for him to do, where he cried out in pain to his Father in heaven and says, "Let this cup pass from me, if 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 it's possible." Joseph Smith did the same thing. He could have run across to Iowa. He did. He got away. But he came back because his friends wanted him to. He gave up his life knowingly to his people. He knew he was going to die. And why did he? Uh, why did he have the gun smuggled in? Why did he have? What would you do? Who if knows? Came up to you and, and threw a fist at you. Would you try and block it? Why We're not talking. Wait, 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 wait. We're not talking about. We're not talking about me. You're, you're trying to equate Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ. No. No. See, Jesus Jesus was sinless. Jesus was sinless. Okay. And that and that and Joseph wasn't. And I admit that because we've got one Savior, and that was Jesus. Okay. But nevertheless, even even though even though Joseph Smith might have, in a, in, in a moment of weakness, uh, used a gun, which, which he did. I mean, there's no question about that. However, however, it came into his hands, he used it. Okay? He did it in a moment of weakness. Or whatever. Wh wh however you explain it. But nevertheless, he walked into that situation knowing what was going to happen. Maybe not knowing, but feeling pretty sure what was going to happen and his feelings happened to happen to justify themselves and we have other men that were that were like him uh, John Taylor for instance who was not arrested refused to leave his friend's side why and yet this man was not some dumb ignoramus he gen he later rose to become president of the church and lead the church Brigham Young was the same kind of guy he said well Brigham Young He's not. He, he's he's a different guy. He he does. He he, he has a more honest uh, a temper about him. If that's the case, why did he do things at great sacrifice to himself and to his family during the Joseph Smith period? After that, you can say, well, he was he was seeking for glory and for riches and so on and so on. Well, I don't know. For one second, would take take a, a a pot shot at Brigham Young or John Taylor or anybody else's sincerity or their their faith in Joseph Smith. Okay. But, okay. The, but the same thing with Joseph Smith. These are the men. Now, a man who does not do anything and his life is not tried. Jesus says in the New Testament that you are not my disciples if if the world loves you. Now I can tell you. I can tell you from my own experience. You see, you you told your experience. My experience is that right now, with with the exception of those here in this room who don't know me and are justified in thinking that maybe I'm their friend, I don't have any friends because I'm saying things that are hurting everybody and I'm publishing them to the world and people don't like it. I do it because I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. Mm -hmm. I believe that Joseph Smith believed it. I believe that Jesus Christ believed the things that he did. And he gave his life for it. And I look to a man who gives his life for such a cause. I would, if it wasn't for the fact that I know Rulon Allred too well, I would look to Rulon Allred, that same kind of guy, because he gave his life that way. Um, you've got me, I don't know. 
Who are you talking about? He was well, the doctor. Was he not the doctor yeah. that the two yeah. ladies walked in and? Yeah. Oh, all right. 